Hey, hi everyone. Good evening. Uh, my name is Lance Manning. I'm the director of the Texas Healthcare Challenge, and we are starting off this evening with our WISH info session. And we've done a few of these since our WISH hackathon back in January. And um, we have been focused on trying to find ways to help entrepreneurs with various resources to get their companies funded. And mainly that's been through federal grants, the SBIR program. And that's what our speakers have been talking about. So tonight we have a great session for you and we'll be hearing from one of those speakers. And we also have a, a startup company in the area. That's, we call it in the, in the WISH network uh, here in Texas that will be giving her a five minute pitch. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started here and tell you a little bit about our background with, um, with our entity. This is a picture from our last event in January, and we have been focusing on helping early stage entrepreneurs uh, ideate and come up with business ideas. Um, the way we got started with the WISH concept was um, we received funding from the Small Business Administration to uh, fund these sp women-specific hackathons. And we had one in 2020. We also had one earlier this year uh, that was very successful. Uh, on our website, texashealthcarechallenge.com, we have an event report recap from this event, and it goes over a lot of takeaways and various um, examples of people who apply and uh, the different groups that are part of our event. So we encourage you to look for that and review that uh, uh, report recap. Um, here are some other comments about the event and in developing the WISH network, we're gonna keep holding these uh, WISH hackathons, but we also wanna create this network of people who can get together and, and provide mentoring and feedback and encouragement to uh, women entrepreneurs. And so in the next few months, you'll see some announcements about that network and the mentors that we'll be putting together to support. Uh, I mentioned the Small Business Administration and our funding, of course, uh, their funding programs. And there are various federal agencies that have these programs, and our speaker will get into more of this, but uh, the National Institutes of Health, National Science Foundation, there are a number of other entities that have SBIR funding programs that will be very interesting for, for some of our listeners. Uh, and now I'm going to turn the time over to Tim Clark. Uh, before I do, I want to mention to everyone that we will be uh, accepting questions and comments from you. Uh, we'll mainly have a, a Q&A at the end of the presentation, uh, and we are going to allow for some Q&A for our five-minute pitch. So to do that, we will ask you to write your question in the chat. We'll only take questions in the chat, and so if you have something for any, either one of our speakers, please write it out uh, to everyone. Uh, so Tim is a um, health and safety portfolio lead at Aptima. Aptima is a a human performance research company based in Boston. I've known Tim for a couple of years now. He attended one of our Texas Healthcare Challenge events, and he's a, a great leader in our community on the educational and, and healthcare side. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, I'll turn it over to you, Tim. Take it away. All right. Thanks, Lance. So um, I have an introduction for Ivy, but um, I think Marianne, you are going to go first for uh, the five minute pitch, if that's correct. So actually Marianne, I will uh, turn it over to you and let's hear what you have to say. Okay, let me, uh, oh, and there we go, okay. Let me share my screen, yeah. Okay, can you see that? Yes. Okay. All right, let me move you guys out of the way. Let me minimize these videos, there, that's better. Okay. All right. My name is Marianne Marks. I'm the uh, creator and co-founder and CEO of LabSmart, is a bio-individual blood chemistry analysis software. So, oops. okay. This is a, a funny little cartoon. This is a typical um, scenario in a conventional doctor's office where this they're looking at the patient's blood work and the blood work, the value is just right below the inside of the lower end of the lab range. And the doctor says, oh, good news that everything looks normal. But the, you, we know the patient doesn't feel or look normal in this scenario. And what we're talking about here is 
He, this is an example of LabCorp and Quest. This is the, the blood work, the CBC panel that we get from the two top labs in the country. And the, these are the reference inter, intervals or reference ranges that are on the, the lab work. Those reference ranges are, they're defined um, based on the sample population taken at that lab or taken across, across the country. And that represents a 90, 95% of that, that population, which is normally distributed distributed 20, two, two standard deviations from the mean. But that is that does not represent healthy, that's, but that's what's on the lab report. Um, there, we have the, there, there's something in the um, alternative healthcare space called the optimal reference range is where we take one standard deviation from the mean and that represents 68% of the population. And that's where that, that patient's value should fall. And if they fall at the upper and lower ends of those, those reference ranges, we look at those and um, wanna, wanna address those before they become issues. So th this is the evolution of reference ranges. I have, is that me? I have like five minutes. Oh, no. Okay, uh, this, this here is the ev evolution of the reference ranges, how we start out with lab reference ranges on the lab, a wide set of ranges. We have now optimal or functional refer reference ranges that are tighter set of reference ranges that represent optimal health. And those are determined by a few different methods. <clears throat> then we even have a, a, a more accurate set of reference ranges based on evidence and scientific studies based on mortality and disease studies. And then we have even further set of um, uh, specialized ranges based on and, and adjustments based on the personalized attributes of a patient. Uh, and then that's what the software does. It's <clears throat> Real quick, uh, conventional medicine, what they, they look at lab work and doctors typically wait until the, the values fall outside of the lab ranges. And by that time, the condition may be in a late stage of disease and would, would require medication and treatment. But in this, this world of, it's called functional blood chemistry analysis, where we're pr more proactive, where we look at results based on a tighter set of reference range that represent optimal health so we can find and identify imbalances before they reach the disease state. <clears throat> and there's some benefit, there's a lot of benefits of using blood chemistry analysis. And the way we do that, there's an interpretation. We look at, we compare the results against these reference ranges, and then we look for patterns, and then we compare those patterns, those values over time to look for trends. Uh, and we and in, within the software, we adjust the reference ranges based on all sorts of bio individual um, traits of that patient's. What pa there's different reference ranges for a woman in a different trimester of pregnancy, or a different menstrual phase, or different menopausal status, or various you know somebody living at a higher elevation. So what in, in, within the software, we adjust those reference ranges based on the traits. Of that, and, and here's a quick example of, of what this means. So, on the CBC that you get from your doctor, there's this is a quick example of functional blood chemistry analysis. We'll look at the red blood cell related markers, and those are used in the assessment of anemia, which is the identification and root cause, which is when the um, oxygen the oxygen is delivered to all cells of the body by the red blood cells. And if they're not functioning properly, um, that there can be the cause of fatigue and weakness and lack of energy. And there's, an, there's a science around the assessment of this. And within the software, we look for, we identify the likelihood of anemia, the type of anemia, and then help the practitioner uh, <clears throat> identify the possible root causes of that anemia through pattern recognition that, that we use in within the software. And th this is just an example. And the more attributes that you have, the more narrow and we can get to help identify the root cause. So there's a, a growing trend for a lot more people taking a proactive interest in their health. A lot more people are going to see alternative, integrative, functional, holistic health and wellness practitioners. And, and a part of what they do is spend a good amount of time assessing blood work around this functional blood chemistry analysis and having a software that would save them time um, has been has been a big benefit. And I've been so there, there's a market opportunity here that I'm, I'm right now I'm focus, focusing on the alternative healthcare practitioners, chiropractors, naturopaths, but there's also, also opportunities for me to partner with different labs. And then there's also a direct consumer market because there's a lot of people today now buying tests on their own. <clears throat> Here's an example. I did a, 
a market analysis around chiropractors. And I found that they did the survey with chiropractors and these are the percentage of them that look at blood work. So I, I got some numbers around, just around chiropractors. So I need to, I need to expand this around all the other alternative practitioners, as well as then I get to the next level with what's the market analysis around the direct to consumer market that I may, may um, target. And uh, that's me. So this is me. I, I've, I've just, I was in the tech world for 20 years and I just switched careers, got into health, but couldn't let my techie side uh, go and uh, started this startup about four, four years ago now. And uh, it's been pretty exciting. That's it. Did I make it in my five, within my five I minutes? I think you got it in less All than right. five minutes. All right. Here, I'll stop my share. Here. All right. Thank you so much, Marianne. Um, I think we might have time for one question. Um, but if we don't get to the in other questions, we can always save those for the end. What health problems do people have to get the kind of help your company is offering? Do consumers really want optimal health that bioindividual blood chemistry can give them? Well, so the so this is why I'm targeting alternative right now, alternative healthcare practitioners, medical doctors who go into functional medicine, chiropractors, naturopaths, people who spend more time than just five five minutes with their patients that can actually, and those are the kind of people who seek to pay cash for health services are seeking reports from this kind of product that, that are looking for optimal health. Um, we see, does the software avoid having too many variables? I've heard too many variables, mass mixing signals. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty simple what it does. I can, there's some demos on my site that, that gets into the, the detail of how it works. Well, that, that, that might be it for now. Great, thank you so much. Um, yeah. Yeah. Again, under five minutes, that's a good pitch. All right. All right. Um, so uh, yeah. uh, Marianne's uh, website, Lab Smarts, is down at the bottom. Um, so please check that out. All right. But um, uh, for now, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. Ivy Estbrook, um, who's going to give us uh, an introduction to SBIR, something she's forgotten more about than most of us will ever know. Um, so Ivy spent her career accelerating uh, the adoption of emerging technology in both public and private sectors. She started a career at the Office of Naval Research, or ONR, leading the development of analytical and training tools to support diverse military missions. Ivy then led the state of Utah's technology-based economic development agency, where she expanded the innovation ecosystem by developing incubators, accelerators, and funding programs to support early stage deep technology companies. Since transitioning to the private sector, she has held executive roles at commercial stage biotech startups. And she currently serves as the Vice President of Operations and Corporate Affairs at ID by DNA, a venture-backed startup that leverages next generation sequencing and artificial intelligence to improve infectious disease testing. And also uh, Ivy serves as an independent director for Energy Fuels Incorporated. Uh, Ivy earned a doctorate in neuroscience from Georgetown University a master's in national, uh, national resource strategy from the National Defense University and a bachelor's in biological sciences from Smith College. That is a lot of things. Um, please welcome uh, Dr. Ivy Estabrook. Thanks, Tim, um, and thanks for having me um, tonight. I appreciate everyone taking, um, taking some time to listen to uh, kind of my overview here of SBIR and STTR funding. Um, I guess these are, let's see if I can, there we go. Um, this is kind of the quick agenda I've put together. So what is SBIR and STTR as a funding opportunity? Um, what do you need to demonstrate in your application? And what should you consider when you're applying for the SBIR program? Um, and what you may be asking is why should we listen to you talk about SBIR? Um, so I actually am in sort of a unique position in that um, when I worked at the Office of Naval Research, um, I had solicitations for SBIR, so was the government sponsor for a number of SBIR topics um, and programs over the years. Um, and then when I moved to the state of Utah to run the state's tech-based economic development agency, we had an office that was dedicated um, to supporting companies in Utah 
that were um, applying for SBIRs. So we didn't write proposals, um, but we did a lot of critiquing and training. An SBIR proposal, which I'll touch on a little bit, is, is quite a different beast from your R01 or other uh, research funding opportunities, and you need to shape your proposal accordingly. And then once I transitioned to the private sector, I've written um, several SBIRs myself um, and received funding um, for some of those proposals. So I've sort of seen it from all sides, which I think does give me a little bit of a unique perspective and hopefully um, can be helpful to you. Okay, so uh, what is <clears throat> the SBIR STTR program? So they're actually um, kind of a pair. So both programs are focused on supporting small businesses and developing and commercializing technology. Um, they're a little different, I'll get into that. Um, the Small Business Administration has oversight um, broadly of the program, but every um, R&D agency within the federal government that meets a budget threshold is required to set aside a portion of their um, R&D budgets, kind of a, a tax on those budgets uh, to support SBIR and STTR. It's a congressionally mandated program um, and comes up for reauthorization every, I think it's every five years and is up for reauthorization this year. Um, for those of you who are interested in the political part of it, um, it has passed the House, um, but it has not passed the Senate yet. And so if you have a relationship with your senators, um, it would be good to drop them a note. Um, this is a, a great program for um, early stage companies and it would be kind of a shame if it uh, disappeared in the politics of, of the day. Um, okay, so, so what is the mission and the goals? This I stole um, largely from the SBA um, website. And I think one of the interesting things about this program is that it's really meant to support science and technology, but critically has this commercial um, business component to it. So unlike NIH, general NIH funding or NSF funding, um, and even lots of, of DOD or Department of Energy funding, really the, the goal is to grow small businesses and give um, more technical entrepreneurs the opportunity to develop new technologies, take technology that's been developed out of universities and commercialize it, um, and then typically or, or often along with that every five year authorization comes some additional language around um, trying to spread innovation to rural areas in the United States, um, underrepresented groups in entrepreneur and, and technology development. And then I think there's a lot of discussion of this, though I'm not sure the program's been that successful of trying to pull through research from labs and actually or federally funded labs um, into commercialization. And that's really where the STTR program comes in, um, which has a requirement to work with universities and is an opportunity um, to try and mature um, that basic research that's done at universities into uh, technology that can be commercialized. Um, so as, as I mentioned on a previous slide, um, every agency that has an R&D budget over $100 million has to have an SBIR program. So listed here are all of the, the agencies that currently have SBIR programs. I did wanna note that um, within sort of health and human services, both CDC and NIH have distinct SBIR programs. Um, and then within the Department of Defense, um, the Department of Defense writ large has programs, but so do all the services and some of the sub agencies like the Defense Health Agency, um, Defense Threat Reduction Agency all run their own independent SBIR programs. So depending on um, what your technology is, you may find a home with more than one of these agencies. Um, and I'd encourage you to look broadly <laughs> because different agencies run their programs slightly differently and often um, topics that might be of interest, say to the army 
are also of interest to NSF or um, Health and Human Services at the NIH part as well. Okay, so um, what are the requirements uh, for submit for proposing to SBIR or being able to access this funding? Um, as is in the title of Small Business Innovative Research Program, um, you have to be a small business. So you also have to be a business, um, which is something that uh, sometimes uh, academic communities get a little wound up about that um, they can't apply for SBIRs and it's, it's research money, but you have to be a small for-profit business. Um, you have to be uh, more than 50% controlled by um, individuals that are US citizens. Some agencies do have a carve out um, if you, if more than 50% is controlled by venture capitalists, um, but that varies by agency to agency. Um, and so you need to kind of look at the fine print if you fall into that um, category and you can have no more than 500 employees. Um, for STTRs, um, you have to have a small business partner with an institution, a US institution of higher ed. Um, and there are different um, thresholds for how much of the work needs to be done by the business and how much needs to be done by the institution of higher education. Um, these, these are great opportunities if you already have a university partner. Um, if you don't, at least in my experience, I've seen um, that working with uh, higher ed institutions, you can often get really bogged down in things like IP sharing and licensing. Um, and so sometimes it's better to, if you wanna work with a higher ed institution or a faculty member to make them a consultant rather than going after the STTR funding, but happy to answer questions on that if, um, if that's relevant to anybody. Okay, so SBIR programs um, in, in general follow this multi-phase process. Um, so the idea is that um, the first phase is relatively short, a relatively small amount of money, but is sort of your feasibility, um, technical merit, and proving that there's commercial traction. Um, depending on the agency, the, um, the value of that phase one can be anywhere from 50K to 225K. Um, NIH uses the 225K typically for the phase one. And the time frame for completing the work can be as short as two months, but um, max is out at six months. Um, typically, and again, there's a lot of variation by agency. Typically, you have to get a phase one in order to go to a phase two. And that um, is both a blessing and a curse. Um, it gives you an opportunity to kind of prove out your idea or your concept. Um, but a lot of companies find that that initial 50K or 225K, um, it's a pretty high, high barrier <laughs> um, to get into the phase two funding line to get this small amount of money um, given the proposal process, um, contracting process, et cetera. So that's something, something to think about when you're considering these programs. Phase two, um, research are typically research and development activities. Um, this can be spread over two years. You can um, accelerate it, but typically there's a two-year maximum on the work plan. And um, 750K has been kind of the standard. Some agencies have options for uh, phase 2B, um, for different plus ups that um, expand that grant um, and that or contract and that time period as well. Um, but again, that varies agency to agency. Um, and then phase three is really considered the commercialization activities. Um, there is not funding from SBA for these phase three activities. Um, they're often um, used in, it, I'm most familiar with how they're used in the Department of Defense. But this allows for someone or an agency that is going to purchase what you developed through um, phase one and phase two to provide additional funding for commercialization, productization, and um, transition to 
that agency or program. Um, there's been a lot of change in the last, I would say, five years in programs. Um, there have been a couple of studies. The National Academy has did a study on SBIR. Others have criticized sort of the um, the structure and the stiffness of the structure of not being very responsive and having some challenges. So some agencies have really tried to enhance what they offer. Um, the Air Force has probably led um, in the, with their AppWorks program, which has, instead of your standard 25 page proposal, they've shortened it down to a brief, um, putting together a briefing deck and a white paper for their phase one. Um, this gives more companies an opportunity to engage and kind of take some of that um, barrier to entry out by having a smaller, quicker turnaround time as well. Um, you know, I guess I gave away the uh, punchline on the last slide, um, which is some of the variations that different agencies have put in place. So AppWorks I just talked about. Um, NIH has um, what they call direct phase two awards. So this allows you to kind of skip um, the phase one process and go directly to a phase two. Um, this kind of increases the, um, the value of the overhead of putting the proposals in by skipping that first phase. However, it is um, generally more competitive to get a direct phase two award. And this um, is one of the items that is in that reauthorization of allowing the NIH to continue this direct to phase two approach. Um, the other opportunity here that ties into the SBIR programs are the, the tech, tech X challenges. Um, the Army started these, um, I think the Navy now has one, and it's a kind of a combination of funding and incubation. So you get some mentoring, um, you have to sort of demonstrate uh, your technology, but it's, it's trying to mimic a little bit more the venture capital pitch um, kind of idea and, and with the goal of pushing through the best technology is the fastest. Typically, it's um, kind of a bake off. You get an initial increment of funding and then it's a competition. And if you win, um, there's a larger award. So a bit more risk, um, but you're also getting exposure to potential customers. Um, so there are some restrictions on SBIR funding that are important to consider as you're um, applying or considering applying. And um, personally, Ivy Estabrook's view, I think these are things that should really be looked at and changed in the program. Um, it's very hard to commercialize a product if you can't use any of the funding for marketing activities or to protect your IP. Those are two critical things that you need to do as you're starting. A company. Um, the funding can be used for technical development, consultants, salaries, and materials. Um, but again, you need to think through how are you going to accomplish these other activities um, with other funding or bootstrapping. Um, one of the things, and I, I'm not sure in Texas, and maybe someone in Texas can chime in on this, but some states have started using state funding to subsidize these other activities. So if you win, so for example, in Utah, if you're successful um, in getting a phase one SBIR, there's a supplement that comes from the state that's meant to help cover some of these other costs and make you more successful at a phase two. Um, there are others, I don't know that Texas does it, but um, there are other states that are adopting this model as well to try and be sure that companies um, have the consistency to be successful and have resources for all of sort of the key activities you need to commercialize. Um, so one of the questions we, we or I often get um, is what's different about the SBIR versus uh, the SBIR opportunity versus this sort of standard funding that um, all of these agencies provide for R&D. Um, and some of these are pros and some of these may be cons, but really the focus of the SBIR is on commercializing technology. It's not general knowledge um, generation. 
when reviewing SBIR proposals, um, there is a focus on, do you understand um, the market? Do you understand how, and do you have experience in commercializing technology? Um, do you have a clear kind of roadmap of how you're going to commercialize? Um, the other thing I think is important to keep in mind is that um, SBIR is really an economic development tool. That's why the Small Business Administration is involved. It's, it's not purely for knowledge generation. It's not purely for research. It's really meant to lead to job creation, uh, revenue generation, and um, sort of lifting the economy in the areas uh, where companies are that get these awards. And one of the, um, the recent investments the SBA has made is to try and support um, companies and organizations that help companies get SBIRs in areas of the country that haven't received many SBIRs. For a long time, the vast majority of awards were going to Massachusetts and California. And the SBA has made a concerted effort to try and hit some of the other ecosystems across the country. Um, and so they do a roadshow every year. I think they've come to Texas in the past where they get all of the program managers for, from the different agencies to go out and meet with companies and talk to folks and help um, advance the programs and in areas where they're not getting their sort of fair share of the SBIR pie. Um, the review and contracting processes are different from other grants and contracts. Um, again, this emphasis on commercialization, one of the things that um, is really focused on in that review process is how are you going to commercialize? Do you have a business plan? Um, do you understand what the market is going, how the market is going to drive or accept your product and how you're going to to be successful in commercializing. commercializing. Um, the contract processes <laughs> vary a bit um, from agency to agency, but at, as I mentioned, the AppWorks program is really a little bit ahead of the curve and um, they're able to fund at least your phase one with a, a credit card charge back to you. So um, they're trying to reduce the, bur the contracting burden that anybody who's worked with the government knows is is um, high and time consuming. Um, the other, one of the other differences too is that for phase ones at least, you don't have to have a fully audited financial system, which um, I can tell you <laughs> um, from the government side, this allowed us to get a lot of good ideas and small companies moving um, quickly where they would have would not have been able to get through the DOD contracting process without um, the SBIR program, at least initially. Um, the other point I wanted to make here that I think is important as you're looking at what agency um, SBIR program you might apply to or consider is that the different agencies um, use the SBIR program differently. So within DOD, Often um, the SBIR awards are used to fill capability gaps and the, the program, the topics that are put out, um, the program managers already have an eye on how this technology fits into a broader program or a broader, um, um, a broader technology um, that either already exists in the department or that is being developed and this capability gap needs to be filled and small business um, has an idea to do that. Therefore, um, those topics, often the program manager is looking for something pretty specific. Um, whereas the NSF, for example, or NIH, they're more kind of open to bring us your good idea and we'll assess whether it's techni technically feasible and whether there's a true market or commercial opportunity for it. Um, but we don't really have a roadmap of where we want it to go or need it to fit in. So sometimes there's more room within the topics at NSF and NIH, um, for example, or USDA um, for new ideas, as opposed to an idea that has to fit into a program that's already there, um, which is um, sometimes true within the DOD. Um, I mentioned audit requirements and audited financials already. 
Um, so what's critical to have a successful um, SBIR proposal? Um, so uh, when I was working for the state of Utah and we were working with, um, with companies kind of every day um, to put, to assess their proposals and help sort of troubleshoot their proposals, really for all agencies. We would, if you were submitting to NASA or you were submitting to the USDA or NIH, didn't really matter who the agency was, um, we would work with companies on getting their proposals um, as competitive as possible. And we actually won the, the Tibbetts Award, which is the award the Small Business Administration gives out every year for excellence in SBIR. Um, the thing that we emphasized over and over again was having um, a clear commercialization plan. Uh, typically, you have to articulate your commercialization plan for your phase two award. That's a component of the proposal. But we found that um, including a discussion of commercialization in your phase one proposal, it was worth taking some space to do that. That as reviewers were looking at um, not just the technical piece of the proposal, but if you took some time to make it clear that you understood the market, you understood the com um, competitive landscape, what it would take to commercialize the technology and who your customer base would be, that that often led to a successful proposal. Um, for DOD, understanding who your transition partner is and being able to articulate that and even better, if you have a letter from the transition partner saying we're interested, those are all things that really supported the, um, the win rate for SBIRs. Okay, so then um, some things to think about. So um, there are some great things about the SBIR program. It's non-dilutive funding, um, which if anybody who's raised money is always happy um, to have as little dilutive funding as possible. Um, so this is a real, a real positive of this program. You don't have to pay it back. Um, it's not diluting your cap table, um, but it does have a few strings and a few challenges. Um, one of which is timing. Um, I think it's really important to understand how long um, this process often takes. The review process, um, can be very slow. It can take six months or nine months, um, depending on the agency, to get your proposal through review. Um, and then the award process is also, I would say, with the exception of the Air Force's AFWORKS program, can take months. I had a phase two that took more than a year um, to award, and that that's pretty hard to manage if you're um, an early stage company and you don't have revenue to keep the cash flow going. So it's something that's really important to consider is that even with a successful phase one um, that moves to phase two, you're going to have some downtime <laughs> um, and you're going to have some downtime even when you know the money's coming uh, before you have access to it. Um, government use rights. So government use rights for your technology, this is in the fine print and every company I've worked at, it's given lawyer, the lawyers a heart attack. Um, and I'm not a lawyer, but the, you know, the government is really trying to minimize um, the potential impact they have on, on your IP or ownership of IP. Um, so the SBIR program has um, I believe it's a 20 year sort of period where the government use rights won't kick in until you're out of that 20 year window. And again, I'm not a lawyer, but um, government use rights doesn't pull away from your commercial rights. It just means if the, that the government has a license, um, a no cost license to your technology. So they can't put a competitor on the market. They can't give your IP to a competitor to compete with you in the market. Um, but this is something that a lot of lawyers kind of seem to have a, a negative reflex to. So if you work closely with a lawyer, this is something to talk about as you're considering putting a proposal in so that you don't uh, go down the road of building a proposal and then having the corporate lawyer panic um, as you're pushing send on the proposal. 
Um, I've learned that one the hard way um, and really recommend seeing eye to eye with your legal counsel on that before you start the proposal process. Um, phase one SBIRs are, are a competitive process, open competition. However, um, once you get through that phase one, the um, into a phase two or phase three, it having that having gone through that phase one competitive process removes some of the acquisition requirements um, on competition and contracting for phase two and phase three. And so it can really be an excellent way to get your foot in the door and have a contract with so in DOD, for example, if you had a phase one with the Navy and the Air Force decided they wanted to continue the development or the commercialization, they can use that Navy contract to do it. So it can often accelerate contracting and um, allow you to not have to go or your program manager to not have to go through an open solicitation for phase two or phase three funding, which will save them a lot of heartache and headache and you heartache and headache as, as well. Um, for DOD or more mission focused agencies, the SBIR also provides um, a great foot in the door um, opportunity. You'll get to know a program manager who also typically has other funding that's available. Um, and once they get to know you and your technology, they may have other ideas of how to use it or, or where they would like to see it or other potential customers for your tech. And so this really provides kind of a broadening of the audience of who um, is aware of your technology and the opportunities you might have um, to sell back to the government. Um, so there are a lot of resources. I couldn't fit them all on one slide. Um, in Texas to help with SBIR um, access. Um, this little website allows you to put in what state you're in and um, access a list of SBA funded resources. Um, and I'd encourage you if you're considering uh, putting an application in to make use of the resources that are available to you. Um, as an entrepreneur, you may do this a few times or you know, 10 times in your career. Some of these, the folks in these offices are doing it over and over and over again with a lot of companies and really have both relationships with the program managers that are going to review your proposal so can reach out and ask questions for you, um, but also have just seen so many proposals that they understand what works and what might be missing and having that extra set of eyes on your proposal um, is only, will only benefit you. Um, and I think that's all I had. I'm happy to take questions. Um, hopefully that was useful. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Ivy. I personally learn a lot every time I listen to you speak about SBIR, STTR, and I think the rest of the group did too. So um, there's a lot of nuance here, and I'm glad you were able to kind of take us through some of those, uh, some of those items. Um, so I think we can open it up for questions here. I know there were a couple of things that were chatted, um, but does anybody have any questions before I get into that, the chat questions? I, uh, hi, I have a quick question. Shereen Abdullah here with Yamlish. Hey, hi, Abby, nice to see you. Um, so you mentioned uh, local resources. I, I can't pull up the site, but um, in any case, are you aware for resources available to, to Texas-based companies um, so we've received a phase one NIH SBIR. We're looking to apply for a phase two. Um, it would be great if we have some resources available that I'm not aware of, so. Yeah, um, let's see. Let me see if I can put this in the chat. And um, can't do more than one thing at a time, unfortunately. Um, yeah, let me put this link in the chat and I would look at it. It looked like um, when I took a quick look, look there were, um, I don't know, maybe 20 different organizations listed. I think some may be more um, helpful than others, um, but I would reach out and um, most of them should be able to either help you or point you to the resources. The SBDCs, the small business, 
forget what the D stands for. Uh, um, offices, which are all around Texas and all around the country, they generally have support um, for SBIRs. Um, and I'd, enc I'd encourage you to, to look at those. Um, I'll also offer, I'm happy to help um, if you wanna connect and can also um, know of a few people that I could connect you to as well if you had specific questions. Okay, great, thank you. So I think we have one question from Banks who's asking for SCTR, can the academic partner be a majority owner? That's a good question. Um, and I'm not sure the answer. Um, I think it depends if it's an individual or if it's the institution. So, you know, I, I know a number of faculty members who have been the PI on the STTR, but they had to also, I think, be part of the company and be doing it in their capacity as a member of the company. Got it. That makes sense. That's helpful. Thank you. Yep. Okay. So I have a, I have a question, and this is kind of more of a just general question. So you've reviewed a lot of SBIRs and STTRs, both ones that you've supported through the state of Utah, um, ones that you've received as a, an ONR program officer. Can you kind of distill one or two top tips that you would provide to this group around just the general composition of a proposal and just kind of getting a concept across? Yeah, so, you know, I'd go back to you. Um, being clear on the commercial commercialization plan, I think that's one thing. So one thing to keep in mind is that for NSF and NIH, they specifically, they have panels specifically to look at SBIRs that are different than their general research review panels. And so they're bringing in serial entrepreneurs to look at those proposals. So those are folks that may not be as deeply technical um, as you are, or as you would potentially expect the reviewers to be, but they are very skilled in building companies um, and commercializing technology. So they're gonna be looking for key things like, do you understand the market? Is your pan plan to be paid not, it's so great, everybody's gonna want one because that's not really a commercialization plan. <laughs> Um, but really demonstrating an understanding of who your customer is, um, how you're going to get from where you are to being able to sell, whether that's manufacturing or regulatory um, payers. If you're in the health healthcare space, um, that's always something that it's good to at least um, be able to highlight that we understand how this works and this is how we're going to approach getting getting paid. Um, so I think that those are the kind of the key things. I think from a, with my former O&R hat on, um, one of the things I always tried to understand was, or tried to glean was, um, did the team understand how mature the technology needed to be at the end of the program to make it useful um, for the department, for the Navy in that case? Um, because often there's a disconnect between um, how mature something needs to be to be truly useful and usable um, and how far you can reasonably get it with the funding that an SBIR provides. Great, thank you. That makes a lot of sense. And I think for those who are less familiar with the, the Department of Defense side, um, I'm not sure if other agency use the, agencies use the technology readiness level or the TRL. You will hear that quite a bit, I think, on the DOD side. And, maybe other organizations, but that's kind of an assessment of how mature your technology is. And, um, it's definitely worth looking up to understand kind of what your technology, how it can be uh, scaled against that. All right, I think we have time for maybe one more question before we end the session here. Um, and Abe already asked it. Um, so how, how are prohibited marketing or sales activities delineated for something like a phase one? Yeah, that, I mean, that's a, that's a good question. And there is a um, link on the SBA site that really articulates what a prohibited 
activity is. Um, and I, I would defer to that. Um, you know, what I had broadly there of the IP, let me see if I can, if I still have it open. The IP and the um, marketing and sales. Yeah, here, let's see. I'll type this in here. Um, that's an, uh, that link that I just put in is a, a decent summary of what's prohibited um, in the SBIR program. Um, and I believe there's a link back to the SBA guidance on it, but that summary I found more useful than um, the SBA citation of the law. Thank you. Specifically, um, I guess when I'm thinking about how strategy and marketing all kind of blend together, um, is it clearly delineated, delineated in that link? Um, it's the clearest I've seen it delineated. I think, I think, you know, some of it is, um, how, like not as I've ever been a government person is how you define it yourself internally. Um, but I, I would be careful about that because it is so clearly defined. And at some point, if you move to a phase two, you'll be audited. So. Thank you. I think it's a huge flaw as I said, <laughs> to the program to um, prevent you from using the funding for IP or for marketing and sales, because in order to be, to successfully commercialize, you need, you need to both protect your IP and be able to sell things. <laughs> so it's kind of a weird um, holding one arm behind your back um, and asking you to jump through the hoop anyway. All right. Um, do we have any final questions for Ivy? <clears throat> okay. Well, again, thank you so much, um, Ivy, for uh, providing us with this information about the SBR STTR program. Um, just a, a wealth of information, as always, and uh, we really appreciate you joining us. Uh, Marianne Marks um, from LabSmarts, thank you also for joining us. Um, Excellent pitch, and we're looking forward to seeing where you take Lab Smarts in the future. Thanks. Um, so I think at this point, I'll turn over to Lance for final words. And um, Lance, you still there? Yep. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you, everyone, Ivy, Marianne, for your, um, your excellent presentations. And uh, again, the WISH Network, we're developing that where we can answer additional questions that people have. and. Uh, plug you into the right resources. So um, stay tuned on that. And we thank you all for joining us tonight. And we'll sign off until next time. Thank you. Bye now. Bye. Thank you.